Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, after over the course of the past few video lectures, we've been learning about planar dynamical systems. In particular, we talked about linear systems, and when we use that knowledge of linear systems to understand hyperbolic fixed points, and we saw that hyperbolic fixed points, they sort of describe nonlinear systems whenever we sort of zoom in on fixed points and find out that they're hyperbolic. Now this comes from a specific theorem in mathematics called the Hartman-Grobman theorem, which tells us that if you look close enough to a hyperbolic fixed point in a nonlinear system, then it qualitatively looks exactly the same as uh, a linearized version of itself, okay? And on top of that, what we also talked about was the macroscopic qualities of planar dynamical systems through sketching of vector fields. Now, the goal of today's lecture is to put all of that together, to provide ourselves with a full qualitative sketch of the dynamics of a planar dynamical system. And in particular, my planar dynamical system I want to work with today is a fun little uh, uh, competition model. So these are called lotka volterra uh, differential equations. And we're going to use it as a description for rabbits and sheep competing in some environment for resources. Okay, so there's no real sort of predation in here. Uh, you know, we're just imagining we have sort of rabbits and sheep and they live in the same field uh, and they're sort of competing for the same uh, uh, vegetation to, to feed on, right? So if the rabbits eat too much of the vegetation, the sheep can't consume it and so their population sort of goes down and vice versa. Now, if you followed my math modeling lecture series, you might be pretty familiar with how we put together some of these models. If you haven't, that's okay. Let me show you what the model looks like. Again, this is more, this class is a dynamical systems class. We're more focused on, you know, understanding dynamical systems, less about the modeling aspect of these things. But nonetheless, it's very important to really sort of have an intuition for what these things are describing. And that will allow us to, you know, extract some information from this and tell, you know, if, you know, potentially answer homework problems or, you know, if you're doing something in real life that requires these, interpret their solutions. Okay, so I have two variables for my planar dynamical system. This is going to be my rabbits. So my x variable is my population of rabbits. My y variable is going to be my population of sheep. Now, the first thing that I want you to notice, again, coming from that math modeling background potentially, is with our rabbit population, here we just have a logistic growth model if you get rid of the sheep interaction here, okay? In particular, it has a, uh, an R value of three. This is to reflect the fact that rabbits are known to reproduce very, very quickly. If you compare that with the sheep model, the R value here is two, and the sheep just grow at a slightly slower rate, okay? Now, beyond the logistic term here, we see that the relative growth rate of the rabbits and of the sheep are driven down by the other species. So more sheep means that the rabbits have less sort of space, less resources to occupy, and so they grow at a slower rate. Similarly, more rabbits means less room for sheep. And in particular here, you can see that the interactions are not proportional. I have two Y here. This is coming from the fact that sheep are big. They take up a lot of space. They take up a lot of resources, right? So, you know, the presence of a single sheep has an, a larger impact on the rabbits than the presence of a single rabbit would have on the sheep. That's why there are different values here. Now, if you really want to, you can get under the hood. You can play with all kinds of different numbers in this. Qualitatively, you're gonna see pretty much the same thing uh, if you put different values here or here, okay? All right, so anytime we're given an ordinary differential equation, we always start the exact same way, and you know what it is. It is finding the fixed points, right? So let's start there. Let's look at what the fixed points are. Well, there's four of them. There's one at zero, zero. This is the, uh, the sort of extinction state, right? No rabbits, no sheep, okay? So my field just has cows in it or something like that. Well, then this would be a terrible model because there's neither of either of the species. There is also a fixed point at zero, two. This would represent the sheep being at carrying capacity and no rabbits, okay? So my 
my field just has sheep in it. And they have completely grown logistically to their carrying capacity. Similarly, there is a fixed point at three zero, same thing. This is the rabbits. They have reproduced and multiplied until they've covered the entire field in a logistic growth model, and there is no sheep to sort of push them out. And then finally, there is this what we call coexistence state, one one, right? So there's relative populations of the rabbits and the sheep that are equal. They are sort of existing in harmony in this case, okay? So, you know, there's enough for both of these populations to sustain each other and they're not sort of crowding each other out. All right, so what we would like to do now that we have all of these fixed points is we wanna do our local linearization, right? So the thing that we talked about in the previous video on hyperbolic fixed points. And we're gonna go through each one of these fixed points. Let's start with zero, zero. Okay. Well, in this case, if you linearize the right-hand side, so remember the Jacobian matrix here, the Jacobian matrix takes this form, three, zero, zero, two. Okay, so again, you might have to familiarize yourself with the previous video's work. We take the Jacobian matrix, we evaluate it at the fixed point zero, zero. We get this diagonal matrix. This thing has eigenvalues three and two, which implies zero, zero is unstable. Both of its eigenvalues have positive real part. And you can see the eigenvectors here are just the axes. So we can get even more information about this. So what we actually know is that trajectories, so trajectories, they leave the origin. They leave the origin uh, parallel to the eigenvector, let's say V, which is zero one, so the y-axis, uh, for lambda equal to two, okay? So again, this is the slow eigen direction. You might have to familiarize yourself with this, but essentially, here's uh, what we have. So if we, if we sketch this out, remember we only care, in this case, about positive x and y values because these are our animal populations, our face, uh, our phase space is the positive quadrant. Essentially, what we see here, the local linearization would give us solutions that come off like this, okay? So again, if you just plotted the trajectories of the linear dynamical system, the only thing we're doing is sort of shrinking them and looking at them locally here. Let's keep going. Let's do it for every fixed point, right? So let's do, uh, let's do zero two next. Okay, so in this case, your Jacobian matrix evaluated at this fixed point is minus one, zero, minus two, minus two, okay? Now, take a look at that. It's an upper, uh, sorry, a lower triangular matrix. That means its eigenvalues are on the diagonal. So again, its eigenvalues are minus one and minus two. Both of those have negative real part. This tells you zero, two is stable. Right? They're all, these two so far are hyperbolic fixed points. And in particular, we can use our linear theory again. We could say that trajectories, so T-R-A-J, so I don't have to write trajectories every time. They approach, they approach zero two along this strong stable eigendirection. So it's, uh, sorry, one minus two eigenvector, uh, which is the eigendirection, right? So that just means the, the uh, line spanned by the eigenvalue uh, for lambda equal to minus one. So the slower of the two eigenvalues. And so the result for this is, maybe I'll, I'll put it up here just to save a little bit of space. Here what this gives me, again, through local linearization techniques, I have a fixed point at zero comma two, so it's right here, 
Remember the phase space is the positive quadrant. And essentially, I've got an eigendirection that looks like this. Again, this is super zoomed in. That's the eigenvector and the eigendirection spanned by one minus two. And I also know that solutions come in along this eigendirection, come in parallel to it. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating the picture here just so that you can see it. But again, uh, linearization techniques, these are local techniques. Anything that involves the, uh, the Taylor expansion means we have to be very close for this to count. So let's keep going. Let's keep rolling. Let's do three zero next. Okay, so in this case, the Jacobian linearized around the fixed point three zero. This gives an upper triangular matrix, minus three, minus six, zero, minus one. Again, triangular matrix. I love triangular matrices because they're so easy to deal with. The eigenvalues here are minus three and minus one. Both have negative real part, which means that uh, three, zero is stable. And Again, you get the same thing, same kind of analysis here. Uh, the, the trajectories you're going to approach along the slow eigendirection. So they approach along the eigenvector associated to minus one. So tra let's say trajectories approach along this eigenvector, which is going to be uh, three minus one. Again, if you feel uncomfortable with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you might have to sort of refresh yourself. But again, use, you're more than welcome to use a computational solver, Wolfram, whatever it happens to be, uh, to do this as well. Let's sketch it out. So in terms of my picture, my local linearization is right, uh, or sorry, my fixed point is on the x-axis. In this case, I've got an eigenvector, again, very blown up just to sort of super illustrate what's going on here and how we can apply the theories. We're coming in parallel to this eigendirection. Again, very exaggerated, but I want you to see that it's stable. It's absorbing nearby trajectories. And you can see now that I've kind of got some pieces, right? I, I, it's like a puzzle that I'm putting together. I've got three local linearizations that I can use to figure out what this thing looks like. And of course, I've got one more fixed point. So let's, uh, let's work on that before we keep going. Let's look at the fixed point one, one. Now, if I calculate my Jacobian about this point, I get one, uh, sorry, minus one, minus two, minus one, minus one. Now this one, I mean, this is a full matrix. You might have to use some little techniques and tricks. It's a two by two matrix. You can use that nice little trace determinant formula for the eigenvalues. Uh, in my case, I'll tell you what they are. Lambda one and two are equal to minus one plus or minus the square root of two. Now the square root of two is about 1.4. So that means one of these is positive and one is negative. That tells me that one, one is a saddle point. Remember a saddle point is a, a fixed point with one direction coming in and one direction going out, right? There's two dimensions here that we're working with. In this case, you have two dimensions going in. In this case, you have two dimensions going out. In this case, you have one going in and one going out. And nothing too fancy that has to happen here. Um, in our case, we have, I'm gonna say, going in on the eigendirection, which is the square root of two comma one, and out on the eigendirection, which is the minus square root of two comma one. And if I do my little sketch, just like I had before, Again, not to scale, just so that we can get a feel for everything. 
What do I have? I have an eigenvector that might look like this, that I'm converging into the fixed point on. And let's use a different color just to emphasize it. I have an eigenvector that looks like this that I am coming out on. Again, it doesn't have to be a perfect drawing. As you know, I'm not a great drawer here, but nonetheless, you can kind of see the saddle structure, right? Trajectories are warping around this thing. And we get this nice sort of one direction going in, one direction going out. And what we could do is we could put it all together. So let's do that now. Let's say all together. All this information together so far, well, I've got a fixed point at zero. I've got a fixed point at, uh, what was it? Zero comma two. So let's put it maybe right here. It's my Y axis. So this is zero two. I've got a fixed point at three comma zero. And then there's one somewhere around here at one one. And what do I know? I know that I come up and out of this thing. I know that I go down and into this thing. I know that I go up and into this thing. And I know that this one in the middle has a little saddle structure to it. Okay, so I just took all the pictures that I just drew and I put them together. Again, local linearization. All I know is what happens near these things, okay? There's uh, no real understanding of what happens away from them. But what you could do now is you could get a little, um, you could put a vector field on top of this. Okay, so what you could actually show is that sort of down here you have arrows that go like this. Up here you have arrows that go like this. Here we got arrows, right? So this different color is just representing arrows and the flow of everything. And now it sort of takes a little bit of common sense to fill this in, okay? So it's a little bit of a guessing game. It's a little bit of an understanding of, of you know, the processes and just doing this a lot. Of course, you know, it's not a... There's, there could be sometimes things hidden from view here. So, you know, this isn't always going to work. Uh, but in this case, we can kind of fill it in. So let's say fill in the rest. Okay. Let's do a big one just so we can really spend some time on this. Okay. Uh, here we are. Three, zero. And I'm going to start with some macroscopic structures first, okay? So, let's do this. Let's take a look at this, okay? Everything comes out of zero. Everything goes into the fixed points on the sides. And this guy in the middle, the saddle, seems to split things, right? If you look at the directions, it looks like if I stay under this line, I wind up over here. If I stay over the line, I wind up over here. Same thing, you know, if I start way out here, I could come down like this, or I could go over like this. And essentially what that means is that there's a divider, right? There's a theoretical line that says if I'm below it, I wind up at three zero. And if I'm above it, I wind up at two zero. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna start by sketching that line, okay? Again, I don't know exactly what it looks like. This is just my sketch. I know that I come out and up like this, and I go in like that. So up and out, and into the, this fixed point at uh, one one. Now I also know that there's another divider up here. I don't know exactly what it looks like. I put some curves on it just for a little bit of delicacy to make it look a little prettier. Again, I don't know exactly what those curves look like, but I have a pretty good idea, right? I know there's a divider line, I know it's a little curvy, and I know that locally it looks like this little X shape. Now similarly, 
I see that if I leave this thing, I get sucked into zero too. So that means that I could be able to draw a little something that looks like this. Actually, maybe I didn't do the best job here. Maybe it should come up like that. Again, doesn't really take an artist to do this stuff. Just trying to get some qualitative information. Same thing, I know that there's a line that comes out this way and it goes into this one. Right, so the little zoomed in X right here, when I zoom out, it has still this X structure. Except that now you can see it connects to the, to the other local pieces. And what you could do is you could just fill in the rest, right? So the rest would be, okay, well, maybe something like this. Again, I have existence and uniqueness of solutions here, so I can't cross anything. I, if I start down in here, I'm stuck in here, and the only place I can go is to three zero. If I start up in here, I have to wind up at three zero as well. If I start up here, I wind up at zero two. And if I start down here, I wind up at zero two. Okay, again, it's not meant to be perfect. Qualitatively though, it has everything that I need. Now, I want you to notice some very important structures here, okay? First of all, one one in the middle of this is called a separatrix. Okay, so one one is a separatrix. Now, what does that mean? Well, you can see the word separate in here. It separates where you go, right? So this stable direction, the direction that's pulling you in, it splits where trajectories wind up. If you are below that stable direction, you wind up at three zero. If you're above it, you wind up at zero two. Okay, so that thing is like a big like fault line, a big earthquake line that goes right through the middle of this picture. If you're above it, you wind up at zero two. If you're below it, you wind up at three zero. In particular, that line has a name, okay? This line of separation, so in my case, it was, a, it was a green curve. I don't know how easy the colors are to see here, but let's say curve going into one one, is the stable manifold of one one. Okay, let's, here's a new term that we've probably never seen before. First of all, we can see the word stable. Remember, we understand what stable means. Stable means you get pulled in. So you can see along this curve, if you started perfectly on the curve, you would wind up at one one. Right? If you're above it, you're at zero two. If you're below it, you're at three zero. But there's a Goldilocks zone. There's a perfect little balance point where you would go right into one one. That one dimensional curve that you lie along to go into it is called the stable manifold. Now, a manifold for our purposes is just curve space. Okay, so it's a one dimensional curve space. Now, a manifold is just a generalization of any sort of dimensional. Uh, space it just has a little bit of curvature right so spheres are manifolds cylinders are manifolds lines planes uh cubes all you know basically every object mathematically that you're interested in is a manifold okay so here you have a little curved line it makes up a manifold similarly you can see that there's another curve here and the other direction that moves away from 1-1 one, one goes straight out from 1-1 one, one into one of the fixed points. So that, that means we have another name. It's in blue on my board. I don't know how easy it is to see, but it's this curve that comes out. So curve going, going out of 1-1 one, one is called, ah, sorry is the unstable manifold. So there's that word again. You can probably figure this one out on your own, right? 
Why is it called unstable? Because it's being pushed away, right? We know unstable is when you get pulled away. It's the unstable manifold of 1-1, one, one, right? Because you're being pushed away from 1-1. One, one. It's a manifold because it's a curved space. And in this, so what we see for saddle points is that you have a direction that goes in on the linear system. That turns into the stable manifold for the nonlinear system. You have a direction that goes out for the linear system. That turns into the unstable manifold for the nonlinear system. Now, your question that you might have is, what about the other fixed points, Jason? Do they have stable and unstable manifolds? Well, let's take a look at zero two. I said any initial condition above the stable manifold of one one will wind up at zero two. This is a two dimensional region, right? It's not a plane, it's, you know, it's sort of like a half plane with a curved boundary, but it's a two dimensional region. Why is it two dimensional? Because there are two directions that go into this. Two on uh, two eigenvalues with negative real part, that means that there are two dimensions flowing into it. And what it looks like in the nonlinear system is this whole two dimensional area. Same thing, sorry, I was pointing at three zero, same thing for three zero. If you're below the stable manifold of one one, anything in this two dimensional region winds up at three zero. Why? Because there are two stable eigenvalues. Okay, so look at that. It means that the eigenvalues tell you the number, the dimensions that you get contracted in and pushed out upon. A saddle has one going in and one going out, stable and unstable manifolds. These points, three, zero, and zero, two, they have entire two dimensional regions where they attract, and that's because they have two eigenvalues that have negative real part. You can turn that logic on its head. Zero, zero has two positive eigenvalues. That means it has two dimensions it pushes stuff away in. But you can see everything gets pushed away from it. Anything under the, uh, under the unstable manifold of one, one gets pushed away from it. So you can actually talk about what's called a basin of attraction. Okay. And a basin of attraction is the set of uh, initial conditions. I'm going to say ICs um, so that uh, the trajectory, so that X of T converges to uh, fixed point X star. Okay, so not, not the most uh, clear explanation here, but let's take a look at this. What's the basin of attraction for the fixed point three zero? Everything underneath the stable manifold of one one. What is the basin of attraction for the fixed point zero two? Everything above the stable manifold of one one. What's the basin of attraction for the fixed point at one one? It's everything on exactly the stable manifold, right? Look, if you're on this curve, you wind up going to one one. And then finally, what's the basin of attraction for zero, zero? The only way you can ever go to zero, zero is if you started there. So the basin of attraction for zero, zero is zero, zero. It's an unstable fixed point. Okay, so it's not easy, right? It takes a little bit of work. It takes, a, it's a multi-step process. Starts with the fixed points. Then it looks at the linearization. Then it sort of puts together, you know, almost like a little Picasso style picture. We can work in a little bit of understanding of vector fields, and then we can try and feel our way around through the dark here. Okay. Now there are tons of programs that will do this for you numerically as well, but you really should try and practice this on your own first, because it really demonstrates and it really helps you to cement your fundamental understanding of dynamical systems, okay? So we're gonna continue sketching dynamical systems. We're gonna slowly ramp up the complexity, see how, what can go on, how things can be complicated, how things can be simple, uh, but this sort of acts as the first example. So I'll see you in the next video, everybody.